All right, so uh, let's get started. So we're, um, we're continuing with uh, quadratic programs, uh, cone programs, uh, duality relationships between uh, 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 um, different cone programs and different quadratic programs. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to wind up um, uh, going into uh, support vector machines, which are one of the uh, big applications of quadratic programming. And they're, um, I think they're a very cool uh, application. And the math is certainly very nice. It, uh, there are a bunch of very, uh, very pretty things uh, to, to look at in duality and support vector machines. So um, let's get started. So um, how many people remember the class before the midterm? OK. Well, just in case you don't, um, uh, we'll start with a bit of review. So uh, um, we talked about quadratic programs, which are to minimize a uh, quadratic program subject to linear equality and inequality constraints. Uh, we talked about cone programs, uh, which are to minimize a linear function subject to cone constraints, right? So ax plus b in some cone, or x itself in some cone, right? Uh, and in particular, we talked about two types of cone programs, uh, semi-definite programs and second-order cone programs. Uh, those are, there's a reason we talked about those. Those are by far the most uh, common cone programs that uh, people talk about, um, with the exception, I guess, of linear programs, right? Linear programs, you can uh, make them by looking at the cone, which is the positive or the non-negative orthant, right? So if you constrain ax plus b to be in the non-negative orthant, you're constraining it to be bigger than or equal to zero. All right, we talked about uh, relationships between these different types of problems. Uh, it turns out that quadratic programs are a subset of second order cone programs. In other words, you can easily turn any quadratic program into, a, into an equivalent second order cone program. Uh, and we didn't show this, but second order cone programs are a subset of semi-definite programs. Uh, so you can easily turn a second order cone program into a semi-definite program. Uh, so, these are sort of increasing levels of uh, expressivity. You can uh, express more and more in the same size program. There are also increasing levels of painfulness to solve. Um, but the algorithms for all of them, uh, uh, as you see, right, as you're reminded here, there's uh, uh, poly time algorithms for all of them. Uh, and by that I mean poly in the uh, size of the representation and also in the accuracy parameter, 1 over epsilon. Right? Uh, and it's a big open question whether you can get rid of that dependence on 1 over epsilon. In other words, whether you can get a purely combinatorial algorithm for, for some of these things. Um, we also pointed out that the second order cone and the semi-definite cone are both self-dual, meaning that the dual cone to each of them is just the cone itself. That turns out to make um, a bunch of things easier to look at. It makes the duality theory prettier. Um, so uh, that's a nice thing to remember. Uh, and we went through a bunch of examples, including uh, group lasso, uh, Huber regression, which is a robust regression. It's when the penalty gets to be linear rather than quadratic on the residuals, uh, once the residuals get to be large enough. Uh, and we talked about matrix completion. All right. So uh, here's the slide on matrix completion. This is where we um, ended the last class. So uh, I'm not going to go through this full derivation again, um, for which everybody is uh, probably, did I lose, what happened to my, I lost my um, tablet, which is weird because I charged it quite recently. Here we go. Well, all right. I don't know what that happened. Um, maybe uh, some kind of radio interference or something. Um, you know, please, please put your uh, cell phones in airline position or something. Um, all right. So here's the uh, here's the derivation, right? So we have a matrix A, which we've observed, except we've only observed the elements, uh, the ij elements for um, ij in some set. We're going to write uh, script O. Um, for the matrix which is 1 or 0, depending on whether we observed the uh, 
deserves the, uh, observes the element, right? And so if we take the Hadamard product of x minus a with o, that masks out the elements we didn't observe, take the Frobenius norm squared of that, and then have a penalty. This is the trace norm penalty, but um, it's a surrogate for the rank penalty, right? A convex surrogate for the rank penalty. Uh, and we argued before that um, uh, this rank, this uh, trace norm penalty could be replaced by lambda times the trace of P plus the trace of Q, uh, where we constrain PX, X transpose Q to be positive semi-definite, right? And so that turns this into a semi-definite program because we now have, um, well, a, uh, a quadratic objective uh, plus a semi-definite constraint, okay? Uh, and I argued uh, at some length why this is equivalent to this, right? Um, and one thing which I uh, wanted to point out was that there was one thing where I went a little bit too quickly last time. So um, here, right, so we, we took, um, we wanted to show here that um, uh, m bigger than or equal to zero, right, m positive semi-definite was this, um, uh, right, constraining this to be positive semi-definite uh, meant that you had um, a bound on this trace norm, right? And so we, um, we took, so if you're positive semi-definite, that means the dot product with any positive semi-definite matrix is non-negative. We took a particular one, we worked out the trace of B transpose M, which was this, and I just blithely crossed out these two terms, right? And so the thing that I went a little bit too quickly on was that, um, let's say X is taller than it is wide, right? Then V is a square matrix, so VV transpose is indeed the identity. U, U transpose is not the identity, it's a projection matrix, right? Um, but it only reduces the trace to, um, uh, to multiply by a projection matrix, so crossing this out doesn't change the inequality, right? So I wanted to point that out. Uh, somebody came up to me after class and pointed out that I had gone a little bit too fast with that, uh, so it's worth, worth just, uh, uh, just pointing it out. And also that has the advantage of reminding you of what this proof looks like. All right, so that was matrix completion. Now let's go to... Um, uh, the next example, which is max variance unfolding, uh, also no, known as semi-definite embedding. And so uh, this is going to be a problem for, um, it's going to be essentially a nonlinear version of principal components analysis. So the point of either principal components analysis or maximum variance unfolding uh, is that we're given some, um, uh, we're given some, um, uh, points x, which are in a high dimensional space, dimension n. And what we want to do is find a bunch of points y, which are in a lower dimensional space, k much less than n, um, such that we preserve uh, distances approximately, right? So for principal components analysis, we want to preserve every distance. For maximum variance unfolding, we want to do something a little bit nonlinear. We want to preserve only the distances in some network of edges. So typically what we'll do is we'll take small Euclidean distances. So here, two is the high dimensional space, right? And one will be the low dimensional space because that's what I can draw on the slide. And so we've made a network of edges between nearby points. And the idea is that suppose that our points are sort of spread out over some curved manifold in high dimensions, right? We can trust the small distances, right? Distances along, uh, along the surface of the manifold. Euclidean distance is about the same as the distance along the manifold. But if the manifold comes back and comes close to self-intersecting, we could have two points with very small Euclidean distance where the distance along the manifold is much larger, right? So the idea is, yeah, go ahead. Oh, um, sorry, a manifold is uh, essentially a curved surface in high dimensions, right? So the definition is, is a bit more complicated than that. Uh, it's basically a subset, of uh, a subset of your high dimensional space which is locally smooth, uh, right? So it doesn't, doesn't have sharp kinks in it, it doesn't self-intersect, okay? 
So uh, what we want, what we what we imagine is that our data is on some high dimensional manifold, right? Curved manifold. And what we want to do is flatten that manifold out and be able to have coordinates for our data that look like just plain Euclidean coordinates, right? Not necessarily possible for every manifold, but we want to try and do that. Okay. So. Um, Right, so the small distances uh, are the ones we want to preserve. The large distances we don't care about preserving. Um, if we were just looking for a subspace of Rn, right, principal components analysis solves this problem directly. PCA is designed exactly to find a subspace of a higher dimensional space. What we're going to do instead is two steps. So we're first going to um, look for some new points z, which are in the same space, right? Rn is the high dimensional space. And we're going to constrain zi minus zj to be the same as xi minus xj. This is Euclidean norm, right? So we can measure Euclidean norm. We don't know the manifold, so we can't, uh, we can't measure the manifold norm, right? But we know that small Euclidean norms are likely to be approximately equal to the manifold distance, right? So what we're going to do is preserve the small ones and then try and do an optimization problem to figure out the larger ones, OK? All right, so what we're going to do, uh, first step, we're going to um, re-embed the points in the same dimension, right? And what we're going to try and do is take the manifold and make it, instead of a curved manifold, stretch it out so that it's a plane. Right? So if we take our, you know, let's say, a C-shaped manifold and stretch it out to be a line, right? then what we can do in the second step is do PCA, and PCA will find the line for us. Right? So it's sort of a two-step process. We, re -embed, we embed in the, in the same dimension that we did before, but try and make it a nicer manifold, something close to a subspace, and then use PCA to find that subspace. Right? And the way we stretch it out is we um, well, qualitatively, what we're going to do is try and maximize the variance of the points z, right? So if you think about putting like a positive electrical charge on each one of the points, right, and letting them go, they'll sort of spring out, right? So make them repel, repel uh, as much as possible. So that's uh, basically what we're going to uh, do. We're going to try and maximize the sum of squares of interpoint distances, which is the same as the variance. All right? So does that qualitatively make sense as an algorithm? All right. And spoiler alert, it's going to turn out that this problem of maximizing variance is going to be a semi-definite program. And that's what we're going to show on the next uh, slide. So here's, the, um, here's the, the exact thing that we optimize, right? So here's the constraint that zi minus zj has the same norm as xi minus xj for all i and j in our edge matrix. And what we're going to do is maximize the trace of the covariance of z. Right? And I argued before that um, that's essentially the same as having the points all repel one another. Uh, and so that's going to be maximizing this is what's going to wind up um, causing our manifold to unfold. Right? So this is why it's called maximum variance unfolding. It's also called semi-definite embedding because it's an embedding algorithm that uses a semi-definite program. All right? So. Um, I'm going to start by defining a few quantities. So we'll say that uh, x is the matrix, um, which has um, uh, well, it's going to be uh, x1, x2, right, all the way up to xt, right. So this is going to be the matrix with all of the x points as the columns, um, uh, and I will define. Uh, z to be the same thing for the z points, z1 up to zt, right? So this is capital, uh, capital Z here, OK? Um, and then I'm going to define um, p to be x transpose x and q to be z transpose z, OK? Um, and so this is the elements of z are going to be the pairwise dot products between different x uh, between different x points, and the elements of Q are going to be the pairwise dot products between different z points, right? Um, and so P here, right? This this is going to be given, 
right? And what we're going to do, uh, Q will be our optimization variable. Okay? So we've done a change of variables here, right? I'm, you, I'm giving you Q instead of Z. Um, and it's pretty clear I can go from Z to Q. It's not obvious that I can go from Q back to Z. Uh, but it turns out, for example, if you, <coughs> if you have any kind of factorization of Q, right? If you factor Q as Z, Z transpose, or Z transpose Z, right? Doesn't matter how you factor it, you'll still get the same pairwise dot product. And so that's going to be how we go back from Q to Z. We'll just factor it when we're done. OK? The other thing to note uh, is that we'll have the constraint that Q is positive semi-definite, right? Because, well, it has to be positive semi-definite in order to be a matrix of dot products of points. Uh, and so we'll just make that constraint. And there's where we're going to have a semi-definite program. OK? All right, so now our job is just to write the objective and the constraints in terms of Q. And if we can do that, then we're good, right? So um, for the constraints, let's take a look at, uh, for example, um, uh, ZI minus ZJ norm squared, right? Well, that's equal to uh, ZI transpose zi minus 2 zi transpose zj plus uh, zj transpose zj, right? Just expanding the square. And so these are elements of q, right? This is uh, qii I minus 2 qij plus qjj, right? And we're going to constrain that to be equal to the same thing for the x's, which is the p matrix, uh, p i i minus 2 p i j plus p j j, right? So this here, the right-hand side is known, and this is going to be a linear constraint on the q matrix, right? And so it's perfectly fine to add linear constraints into our semi-definite program, right? We now have a, one semi-definite constraint and a bunch of linear equality constraints, OK? And these implement uh, then the fact that Q is a covariance matrix uh, and also, sorry, a matrix of pairwise dot products, which is a Gram matrix, not a covariance matrix. Um, uh, so they implement that Q is a Gram matrix, uh, and they implement that Q matches P uh, whenever I and J are in our set of observed edges. Okay. What's the difference between Gram matrix? Oh, uh, sorry. A uh, covariance matrix is uh, the, um, it, it's basically the difference between XX transpose and X transpose X, right? So a, um, a gram matrix is a matrix of pairwise dot products of your data points. And the covariance matrix is the expected squared data points, right? So it's the expected value of X times X transpose, right? Uh, and uh, qualitatively, or Intuitively, what, what that winds up doing is if you have a matrix like this X matrix where you have your data points as columns, if you multiply one way uh, uh, here, X transpose X, right, you'll get the Gram matrix. And if you multiply the other way, X, X transpose, you'll get the covariance matrix. Is there the same uh, yeah, they are, they're, very similar, um, they're very similar quantities. Um, so for example, uh, the eigenvalues of the Gram matrix and the covariance matrix are the same, uh, except that people usually scale the covariance matrix. So then the eigenvalues would be scaled. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, right. So. Um, why do I only care about the diagonal of the covariance matrix? Um, what's that? I, I can't hear you. No, no, the covariance matrix is not going to be orthonormal. Um, so uh, let's see. <clears throat> 
I guess I only argued intuitively that the trace of the covariance matrix is the right thing to maximize. Um, let me uh, let me do the next derivation, and then I think I might be able to argue a little bit more uh, a little bit more precisely. Right. So what I'm going to do uh, the next derivation is to try and write the covariance, the trace of the covariance, as uh, something in terms of this Q variable, right? Um, and so uh, the covariance of the Z's, right, that's equal to um, 1 over N uh, sum over I, ZI minus the mean of ZI, right, times ZI minus the mean of ZI transpose. Right. So um, if we uh, expand that out, right, this is equal to 1 over n uh, sum of zi, zi transpose um, minus z bar, z bar transpose, right? So what I've done is I've expanded this out, right, and then uh, there's a term sum of zi times z bar, but I can just pull out the sum of zi and turn it into another z bar, right? And so we have minus 2 z bar squared plus z bar squared, and so that just turns into minus z bar squared, okay? Okay, um, and so if I write that in terms of our matrix z, right, that's um, 1 over n, uh, Z, Z transpose minus, uh, okay, so the mean of Z, right, um, is going to wind up being, I just sum all of the uh, columns of Z and divide by N, right? So I will take Z and I will multiply it by the all ones vector to sum all of its columns and then divide by N, let me hold off on that. Uh, multiply by its transpose, 1 transpose, z transpose, and then there are two n's, so I divide by n squared, right? Okay, so um, if I uh, now take the trace of this, trace of the covariance of z, right, this is going to be uh, 1 over n trace of, well, zz transpose uh, is going to have the same trace as q, which is z transpose z by trace rotation, right? Trace of q um, minus, uh, and then uh, I'm going to um, do trace rotation again to bring this z transpose over next to this z, and so I'll have the trace of uh, Q times 1, 1 transpose over N squared, right? And so now I've written the objective in terms of uh, our optimization variable as well, and so our job is going to be just to maximize this, right, which you can see uh, is a linear objective subject to um, some positive semi uh, some equality constraints and a positive semi-definite constraint, right? So these, this is part of our final program, this is part of our final program, and uh, maximize this thing is part of our final program. All right. Um, so, uh, what I wanted to argue in answer to your question, which is, it's still not immediately clear from this. Um, if I were to write down the sum over all i and j of the distance between zi and zj squared, right? It turns out that with some manipulation, I can turn that into the trace of the covariance of z. Right? So in other words, 
if I maximize the sum of all squared pairwise distances, that's going to be the same as maximizing the trace of the covariance. I don't want to write down that derivation because it'll, uh, it'll take us a little far afield, but intuitively, um, maximizing the trace of the covariance is basically the same as maximizing the size of the cloud of points, and so is maximizing the sum of the squared distances. Okay? Right, so, so, so if you maximize the sum over all pairs of the squared distances, you can manipulate that and turn it into maximizing the trace of the covariance. Okay? Yeah? Right, right. And so the question, the question is why, why don't the uh, off-diagonal elements of the variance matter? Okay? And the only and the only intuition I can offer for that is is the uh, relationship to maximizing the sum of square distances between points. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, this is a linear function of Q, right? It's a nonlinear function of Z. Right. But if I see why it's a linear function, but that's it's just weird to me because maximizing, you know, right. like a norm, that's mm -hmm. a tough problem. Right? Well, so it's maximizing a squared norm, right? Um, Which, yeah, sure. Right, and you're right. It would be, uh, what's, what's in general, maximizing norms can be tough. Okay. But in this particular case, we're able to, because it's part of this particular problem, we well, can... Now, that's a good question. What is it about this problem that makes it easy to maximize a norm? Um, I mean, I think it's basically just that you can turn all of the constraints into linear or semi-definite constraints on Q, right? So it's the fact that um, all of our other constraints happen to be possible to turn into convex constraints on, the, on this matrix, right? Right. If you maximize the norm subject to polyhedral constraints, those polyhedral constraints wouldn't be turnable into something nice on the Gram matrix. Right. I was just saying it's the same with the quality constraints about that. Mm-hmm. Because you can turn that into a linear function to see that makes that Right, right. So it's because, in some sense, we're somewhat lucky that all of these constraints happen to turn into nice constraints on Q. Right, that's what lets us write this in uh, this whole thing as a semi-definite program. Okay, uh, and that's what got the people who proposed this a paper, right? Because they noticed that you could take some important problem and turn it into a semi-definite program uh, in a nice way. Okay. Maybe you don't answer this, but can you give a qualitative comparison between this and like Isomap? Because they do very similar. Things. Right. So, um, so the question is, there's a whole bunch of embedding algorithms, right? So there's um, isomap, Laplacian eigenmaps, uh, and this one, at the very least, and probably a whole bunch of other ones. Um, I mean, qualitatively, they... Very broadly, they behave qualitatively similarly. Um, I don't remember. I think I think people have written comparisons of these things in the literature. Um, Isomap uh, it depends on finding shortest paths in this neighborhood graph, right? And that is um, not robust to like if you include a single extra link, it can totally change all of your distances, right? Um, so my recollection is that isomap performs very well as long as that doesn't happen. And if that happens, it can break. Um, this, I think, is somewhere between isomap and Laplacian eigenmaps in terms of performance. So it can do nicer embeddings, right? Certainly the paper that proposed it said it had very nice embeddings. Um, I don't know how much you can uh, take out of that, but I think I've seen other people claim it had very nice embeddings as well. All right. Other uh, other questions? Okay. <laughs>
Um, right, right. So Q will wind up being rank n at the at the end of this, um, and that's why. So right, you can think of that first step of embedding yourself in the same dimension as a relaxation of the problem of embedding yourself in a lower dimension. So I, I phrased it as two steps. First, embed yourself in the same dimension and then use PCA. But you can also think of the problem of embed yourself in the same dimension as a relaxation of embedding yourself in a lower dimension. Right? So if you had a rank constraint on Q, that would then be a non-convex problem that would force, your, force you to embed yourself directly in the lower, uh, the lower dimensional space. Okay. So I like this algorithm um, just because uh, it's not at all obvious, right, when you first phrase the problem that you can turn it into a semi-definite program, and because it's a, you know, a cool excuse to teach people about semi-definite programs. Um, but, you know, you guys don't have to like it for the second reason, uh, but you should like it for the first reason, right? It was a non-obvious and cool way of using op optimization. All right, so stolen directly from the Weinberger and Saul paper, which is a, a survey of, this, uh, of, of, uh, of work on this method. Um, what they did was uh, they took a whole bunch of images of this teapot, right? This is um, a very well-known teapot, right? It's a synthetically uh, rendered teapot. Uh, and they just rendered it in a whole bunch of orientations, right? They rotated it. Uh, and so if you look at, um, right, so, so naturally it should be a circle, right? But it, it, it's this sort of one-dimensional thing that you could embed in two dimensions. But if you look at the raw data, right, I don't know what the resolution of the image is, but, you know, roughly thousands of pixels, right? So it's in a very high dimension, and this circle is all twisted up, right? And to see how twisted up the circle is, if you look at, uh, let's say, two points that are very close together on the circle, right? So these are two very close angles of the teapot. Um, it's actually going to be the case that the, uh, this query point is closer in Euclidean distance to the point on the opposite side of the circle because the handle and the spout are both green, right? And so they'll replace one another. It's going to be closer to the point on the opposite side of the circle than it is to a slight rotation of the teapot. Right, if you just use raw Euclidean distance on the images. But after you do the maximum variance unfolding, you get this very nice circle where, in fact, distances are exactly what you hope. Right? So if you query with an ang one angle, you'll get a nearby angle as the close point. Okay. Okay, so now uh, time for duality, right? Duality for quadra uh, quadratic programs and for cone programs. Um, so I'm going to do both of them at once, um, partly just for practice, partly so that I don't do the same thing twice, uh, and partly because it's kind of interesting, right, to look at a quadratic cone program and take its dual. All right, so the problem I'm going to take the dual for is to minimize C transpose X, linear term, plus convex quadratic term, X transpose H, X over 2, subject to AX plus B is in K, K is one cone, and X itself is in L, some other cone, right? And so if you use co different cones K and L, you can implement equality, inequality, generalized inequality, free variables, non-negative variables, right? Uh, semi-definite constraints on the variables. So you can, you can implement all of these different sorts of things. For example, if you wanted to say AX was equal to B, you'd choose K to be a very, very uh, simple cone, which is just the origin, right? The smallest possible cone is just the origin. It's closed under positive multiplication, right? And if you uh, constrain AX plus B to be in the set 0, well, then AX plus B has to equal 0, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, for example, if you take the cone, which is uh, R plus, right, the set of all non-negative real numbers, right, you can use that to implement an inequality constraint, right? And if you, you would use that as one component of K, 
uh, for an inequality constraint or for a non-negative variable, you'd use it as one component of L. And if you had 100 non-negative variables, you'd make L be the product of 100 copies of the non-negative real line, right? Which is to say the positive orthant. OK. So um, again, uh, just to keep things nice, we're going to assume that K and L are both proper cones. Uh, to remind you, a proper cone is one that's a closed set, contains its limit points. A convex set, it's solid, meaning that it has an interior, right? And it's pointed, meaning that it doesn't contain a whole uh, line, right? So um, uh, this is these proper constraints are going to mean that the duals of the cones are also proper, and it's going to let us avoid a whole bunch of annoying special cases. OK? Yes, you're right. It is not. So we're not going to assume that. Uh, let me get back to you for how I'm going to weasel out of that. Um, sorry, the, the question was, uh, isn't the cone for AX equals B, which is just the origin, that's not a solid cone, right? Because it doesn't have an interior. Uh, and I didn't notice that when I was preparing the slides. Uh, but I'll try and, uh, try and think what the, uh, re what the relaxation of this is. For now, let's guess that we don't have to have solid or pointed. Um, that is just closed convex cones, and we'll see if that gets us in trouble later. Okay, so. Uh, yes? That's right. Right, so you can do equality with two matching inequalities. Um, that's another way, possibly, to weasel out of it. Um, Again, I'll think about it and see what the best, the best weaseling is. Uh, OK. So if we want just a cone program, we set h to be 0, right, and have just a linear term. And if we want just a quadratic program, we set this to be k and l to be non-negative orthant, for example. OK? All right. So um, suppose we pick some vector y, which is in k star, right? Uh, and some other vector s, which is in uh, l star, right? Well, that means that, uh, for example, y transpose a x minus, uh, sorry, plus b is greater than or equal to 0, right? That's the definition of what it means for these two things to be in k and k star. Right? And then the same thing, x transpose s is greater than or equal to 0. Okay? So um, let's start making bounds on our objective. Right? So we have c transpose x plus x transpose h x over 2 is greater than or equal to. Well, uh, to make it greater than or equal to, I can subtract a positive number. Right? So I'll just do c transpose x plus x transpose h x over 2 minus y transpose a x plus b minus s transpose x, right? Um, and now uh, this is certainly uh, bigger than or equal to the um, min over z of c transpose z plus z transpose h z over 2 minus y transpose a z plus b minus s transpose z, right? The, you know, this is certainly bigger than the minimum over all possible values. Um, and so now let's, uh, let's figure out what this minimum is, right? So uh, that means we take the gradient with respect to z, right? And uh, we'll, we'll set that to 0, right? So 0 is equal to um, the gradient of this thing with respect to z, which is c plus hz minus a transpose y minus s, right? Um, and so this thing here, right, this is going to be a constraint in our dual program, okay? Um, 
and we can uh, uh, also rewrite it to uh, say what HZ is, right? So um, HZ will equal uh, S plus A transpose Y minus C, right? Um, and so we can now use this to substitute back in here, right? And so uh, this is going to equal um, uh, right. HZ is on this side, so we're moving S and plus A transpose Y over to that side. Oh, this this should be plus. This, oh, this is supposed to be a plus sign, yes. You're just saying that my, um, my handwriting is horrible as usual. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, OK, so now um, let's substitute that back in over here, right? Um, and so uh, if you look at the um, coefficient, the linear coefficient of z, right, it's going to be c. Uh, minus a transpose y minus s, right? So it's going to be minus hz, right? So this is going to be this c trans, all of those terms together will be minus uh, z transpose hz, right? And we now have a plus z transpose hz over 2, so I'll just make it minus that over 2, right? Um, and then we got rid of all of the terms containing z, so we only have uh, minus y transpose b left, right? So that's kind of cool, right? It's always nice when a lot of things cancel. Um, and we're done deriving the dual, right? So the dual is going to be to make the tightest possible lower bound. So the dual is going to be uh, to maximize uh, minus z transpose h z over 2 minus y transpose b subject to our constraint up here. Uh, 0 is equal to c plus h z minus a transpose y minus s. Right? Oh, and we also had these two constraints up here right? on y and s. So that is um, uh, basically that uh, y is in k star and s is in l star, right? And so if we want to, we can combine these two constraints. Whoops, that was pretty bad, right? So these two constraints together, uh, we can move s over to that side and say s is equal to c plus hz minus a transpose y. And so that's the same as saying uh, c plus hz minus a transpose y is in L star, right? So we have either those two constraints or this one, all right? So that's our, um, that is our dual. Uh, and so I'm just going to copy all of that to the next slide. Uh, did we? Um, here it is. Right, so that's the, um, the primal dual pair. Hopefully this is the same as what I derived on the previous slide. Um, and uh, I think it might be uh, a good time now to take a brief break, uh, and we'll come back and uh, talk about the primal dual pair when we get back. All right, so uh, let's, get, uh, let's get back started again. Um, so here's our primal dual pair. Um, Right, and we, we derived that on the previous slide. And what I wanted to point out was just that, uh, you know, some relationships between the primal and the dual, right? So uh, first, and maybe most obvious, is that k and l turn into k star and l star, right? So k and l turn into their dual cones, right? Um, k, which was on the linear constraint here, right? So this was a linear equality or inequality constraint. It's now the cone that's on the variable itself. So k star is on y instead of on this stuff here. Whereas this l here was on the variable, and l star is on the linear constraint in the dual, 
right? Um, min problem turns into a max problem. Um, the positive, uh, the convex quadratic term turns into a concave quadratic term, right? Um, C, the objective vector, turns out, turns into the constant part of the linear constraint. B, the constant part of the linear constraint, turns out to be the objective vector here, right? And so, in general, what you're doing when you go between the primal and the dual is interchanging the roles of variables and constraints, right? And so, that, you see that in two different places here, right? K and K star are on the constraints or the variables versus L and L star on the variables and the constraints. And then the same thing, right, C is on the variables and B is on the constraints, and here B is on the variables and C is on the constraints, right? So that sort of uh, structure um, often happens when you take the dual of an optimization problem. Uh, and I just wanted to point it out here. It can help you notice if something's going wrong, right, if you're taking the dual and something ends up in the wrong place. Um, the other thing, uh, is the, uh, there's a lack of symmetry between the primal and the dual that's, to me, kind of interesting, right? Here, H was just the, in the objective, but here, H appears in the linear constraint as well. So, uh, right, um, I mean, there's another lack of symmetry, uh, like, w for example, in linear programs, when you took the dual of an inequality form program, you got a standard form program and vice versa, right? Here, that gets turned into k versus k star and l versus l star, but the quadratic program adds this extra additional uh, small asymmetry, which I think is interesting. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that, uh, for example, if some, uh, suppose k is a product of uh, zeros and positive orthants, right? Uh, so every time you have a, an equality constraint that corresponds to a zero component of k, the dual of zero is the entire real line, so that'll turn into a free variable in the dual, right? And so that's the same as linear programs, right? If you had a, uh, an equality constraint, it would turn into a free variable. And the same thing uh, if you had an inequality constraint, right, that corresponds to a component of a that's a half line, uh, right, yeah, half line. Uh, and the dual of the half line is the half line at, again, and so that'll turn into a non-negative variable, right? So uh, duals have the, the usual structure that we're used to. It's just a little bit more general here in the primal dual pair of cone programs. Okay. I'm sorry, why what? Why are we happier with a dual? Um, we might not be. We might be less happy with the dual, right? So the dual is just a different way of expressing the same optimization problem as the primal. Um, and sort of th throughout the course so far, and even more commonly coming up, you'll see places where taking the dual of an optimization problem lends additional insight into that problem, right? So for example, if you remember max flow and min cut, Right? It wasn't obvious that the dual of max flow was min cut, uh, but that's right. It's still a quadratic cone program, right? So, so for uh, for particular problems, right here, there's no there's no simplification in the dual over the primal in the general case, which it, 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 there can't be, right? Because primals and duals are symmetric. So anytime you find one problem where the dual is simpler. Right? That tells you that there must be another problem where the dual is more complicated. Right? But because the primal and dual are different, one of them is often simpler and one of them is often more complicated. And so knowing about the dual, anytime you come across an optimization problem, try taking the dual. If you're lucky, the dual will be simpler, uh, and you write a paper about it. If you're unlucky, the dual is more complicated, but then you say that the uh, more complicated one was the original problem that you cared about and write a paper about how to solve it using the simpler problem, right? So I guess the only really unlucky uh, case is when they're equally hard, right? Which is actually somewhat common. All right. All right. So, um, so let's take a look now. Um, we got the primal dual pair, right? Here's the primal dual pair again. Uh, and I wanted to look at the KKT conditions, right? So um, 
the KKT conditions, uh, there's going to be primal feasibility, right, which is this one and this one. There's going to be dual feasibility, this one and this one, right? Um, and then there's going to be the, the weird one, right, which turns into complementary slackness in linear programs. Um, and the simplest way to remember that one is to say that the value of the two objectives has to match, right? So if, um, in general, in the primal minimization problem, if you have a primal feasible point, its value is going to be higher than the value of any dual feasible point, right? And if they're equal, then, then the primal point must be optimal, the dual point must be optimal, and strong duality has to hold, right? So, um, so I'm go just going to constrain these two objectives to match, right? So that's C transpose X plus X transpose H uh, X over 2 uh, should equal this, but I'm going to move it over to the same side, plus B transpose Y plus Z transpose H z over 2, and that has to equal 0, right? And so this is the, uh, the last remaining KKT constraint, but I'm going to uh, mess with it a bit to try and make it a little bit more uh, interpretable, okay? So um, the first thing I'm going to do uh, is notice that there's an x transpose hx over 2 and a z transpose hz over 2, right? And so I'm going to complete the square. Uh, which means I'm going to add uh, plus x transpose h z minus x transpose h z, right? And so uh, I can take this guy, this guy, and that guy and write them as, um, as uh, x minus z transpose h x minus z over 2, right? Uh, and then I have this uh, plus x transpose hz left over, right? Um, so now I'm also going to add and subtract uh, plus x transpose a y minus x transpose a y. Um, so just to keep our place, I'm going to put dots next to constraints, next to terms that we've taken care of, right? So we've taken care of this term, we've taken care of that term, and we've taken care of that term, right? Um, so now I can get, um, so here's a B transpose Y, right? And an X transpose uh, A Y, right? So that's A X plus B transpose Y, right? So here's the B transpose Y and the X transpose A Y, right? And now, um, If we look at all of these remaining terms, they have an x in them, right? So we'll factor that x out, have x transpose times c, this term, plus hz, that term, uh, minus, uh, whoops, this should be x transpose a transpose, right, to get that to work. Um, and you guys didn't catch me when I transposed it here, but uh, somebody would have caught me if I did it here. So this should be minus A transpose Y, right? Um, and then this whole thing has to equal zero, right? So I completed the square, and I added and subtracted uh, X transpose A transpose Y, right? And then I collected terms in a clever way. Now the interesting thing to note is that this thing here, Right, this term is non-negative because it's a positive definite quadratic term, positive semi-definite quadratic term. This is non-negative because AX plus B is in K and Y is in K star. This one's non-negative because X is in L and this thing is in L star, right? So every single one of these terms is non-negative and they add to zero. Therefore, each one must individually be zero. Right? And so th that's going to be the rest of my KKT conditions. Right? So we'll have um, uh, AX plus B transpose Y is equal to 0. Um, X transpose uh, C plus HZ minus A transpose Y 
whoops, that's a messy y, y is equal to zero. Um, and then this last term, instead of writing it as this being equal to zero, um, I'm going to write it as uh, hx is equal to h, whoops, that's a, uh, is equal to hz, right? Because that's equivalent to this being zero, okay? So these are now my KKT conditions, okay? So we have uh, primal feasibility, dual feasibility, two different complementarity, uh, complementary slackness constraints, uh, and then this one, which is new for the quadratic uh, case, which is hx equals hz, okay? So that's kind of nice, right? And it's, um, it's gonna wind up being useful uh, in a bunch of places. One is um, in optimization, we can check these conditions, and if they're satisfied, we're done. Um, another is, even if we're not running an optimization algorithm, if we come up with some way to get ourselves a primal and dual uh, pair of solutions that satisfy the KKT constraints, we must be there. We must have uh, solved the problem, right? So it's a way to check whether we've solved the problem. Okay. Uh, okay, so again, I just uh, copied them to the next slide. Um, Another thing I, uh, I should point out is that um, if we just had a cone program, in other words, if h were zero, these, whole, these things would simplify, right? So this would become uh, c minus a transpose y in L star, right? This thing would vanish, right? Um, and then this thing would become x transpose c minus a transpose y is equal to zero, right? So in the case of no, uh, no quadratic term, it simplifies, and this is maybe the most common way to see the KKT conditions because the, it's the KKT conditions for a cone program, okay? Oh, I should mention also, um, this lets us, uh, this primal dual pair is going to let us say something about when strong duality holds for a cone program, right? And there are going to be uh, cases where strong duality doesn't hold for cone programs. But Slater's condition, for example, tells you that if you have a point in either the primal or the dual, which is strictly feasible for the cone constraints, right, then you're going to wind up, um, then you're going to wind up with uh, a, uh, um, strong duality holding. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, time now. Oh, go ahead. Uh, so if I remember correctly, strong duality, does it, but we don't have the strong slater condition necessarily in the phone program, right, where if you add in a fine constraint, Right, right. So if you have the affine constraints, if you have affine constraints, those don't have to be strictly satisfied, right? So linear inequalities or inequalities, those can be non-strictly satisfied. You can reduce the strict feasibility to being only for the actual uh, proper cones and uh, before you check slaters. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, one of the most uh, important quadratic programs in machine learning uh, is the support vector machine. So for the rest of uh, for the rest of the class, we'll take a look at them. Uh, and here's a place where duality actually makes a big difference, right? It's going to be the case that in uh, some problems, it will be much, much easier to solve the dual than the primal, uh, or vice versa in other problems. It depends on uh, the relative size of the dimensionality of the problem and the number of examples that we have. Okay, so. Um, Support vector machine, it's a classification problem, right? So we have some, uh, a bunch of x's right over here. And we have, uh, we have um, let's say, a classification surface like that. And then there are some o's over on this side. 
right? And our goal is to find that classification surface, surface, uh, surface right? And right now I'm going to assume the separable case, which means that they're actually, we can classify the training data without errors, okay? And we'll, re we'll relax that in a sec. So, um, our data for the problem are going to be uh, some training examples xi in Rn, uh, and their labels yi, which are uh, in minus 1 and 1, right? So negative and positive, right? Um, so uh, if we have this, um, right? So here's our classification sur surface. Uh, let's say that the origin is over here, right? And so if we draw a normal from the origin to the constraint sur surface, Right? Um, so let's say that um, uh, let's write this uh, plane as um, W dot X um, is uh, greater than or equal to B. Right? And so W will be a vector in the direction of the normal, and B will control the intercept. Right? And in particular, um, if we write uh, W bar equals W over the norm of W, and B bar equals B over the norm of W. Right? So these are unit, uh, W bar is a unit vector. Right? So, um, W bar will be the unit vector in the direction of the constraint, and this distance here will be B bar, right? So um, we also, uh, for a support vector machine, are concerned with the margin by which we classify something, right? So if we draw, uh, for example, this uh, orthogonal, right, that normal to the plane. Um, and if we look at, uh, uh, if we call that the margin, right, so we'll say that uh, margin for the ith example uh, is equal to um, b bar minus w bar dot xi, right? So this is mi for uh, example x i right um, right and because so so um, this is the constraint w dot x minus b is uh, bigger than or equal to zero right so uh, I guess I should say over here right so this one will be let's say m j right and m j will be uh, w bar dot x j minus b bar, right? So it's just the distance that you are on the correct side of the plane. Okay? So this here is x j. Okay. Um, just to consolidate, um, both of these are going to be, so let's say this is, um, this is uh, y equals plus 1 on this side, uh, and y equals minus 1 on that side, right? So uh, if we multiply this thing by minus 1, right? So this is equal to uh, yi times uh, w bar dot xi minus b bar, right? And then y is plus 1 on this side, so they're both equal to yi times w dot x i minus b bar, okay? And so uh, the whole problem then to try and find the hyperplane that separates the points with the maximal possible margin, right? So that's, uh, that's going to be the definition of the support vector machine. And what we want to do is to maximize m such that um, M is less than or equal to, 
yi times xi dot w bar minus b bar for all i. Okay? Now, this is an optimization problem, but it's not a very nice optimization problem because w bar here is constrained to be in the unit sphere, which is not a convex constraint. Okay? So, um, so what are we going to do? We're going to get rid of all of the nasty constraints. Uh, and it looks like this. Right, so this is the margin. We're trying to maximize the margin. I just copied that from the previous slide. Um, so let's define uh, v is equal to w bar over the margin, and d is equal to uh, b bar over the margin. Okay? So we're going to make this change of variables, and it's going to turn this into a nicer optimization problem. Um, so let's see. Um, the, uh, this means that uh, W bar is equal to MV. Uh, B bar is equal to MD, right? Uh, and to get just M, uh, well, the norm of V is equal to the norm of this, which is the norm of W bar, which is 1, divided by M. Okay? So let's just substitute. We have max 1 over m subject to um, so let's uh, divide this constraint through by m, right? So m over m is 1 less than or equal to yi uh, times xi dot w bar over m, right? Which is v minus b bar over m, which is d. Right? So now we have um, uh, still linear constraints here, uh, but we've eliminated the uh, variable w bar, which was constrained to be in the sphere, and replaced it by v, which is anywhere in Rn. Right? And so we've, uh, we've gotten rid of one of the non-convexities. However, we have this annoying 1 over m in the objective. Right? Uh, right. So, so that's going to that's going to be my next my next. Oh yes, you're right. Should be one over the norm of v. One over the norm of v. Okay. So this still is nice and nonlinear, right? The point still holds. Um, that it's hard to maximize this thing because that's a non-convex objective. Um, so what are we going to do? We'll make a, a monotone transformation of this objective, right? So 1 over v is monotone decreasing in the norm of v. v squared is monotone increasing in the norm of v. And so we're going to say min norm of v squared subject to these same constraints. Okay? And now we have a uh, convex quadratic objective that we're minimizing subject to linear constraints, and we've turned it into a quadratic program. Okay? Probably any of you who have taken machine learning have seen this derivation before, uh, but I think it's a cool derivation. It's worth, uh, it's worth looking at again. Um, all right, so um, for example, right? Uh, so here's a uh, here's a solution to the support vector uh, problem, right? And so um, right, so w bar will look like that. Um, b bar will be that uh, tiny distance between the origin and the line, uh, and the margin. Right, is going to be this distance here. Turns out there are three different points that exactly lie on the margin in this example. Um, and these points that lie exactly on the margin, right? so if we draw, this is something like that. right? So 
these points that lie exactly on the margin, those are called support vectors. Um, vectors because, well, they're points in Rn, and support because they're, the margin is sort of lying up against them. Uh, it's being, the margin's being supported by them. Um, and typically in D dimensions, or uh, I guess I called it N dimensions, there are going to be N plus one of them, right? So here in two dimensions, there are typically going to be three. Um, now uh, we can um, also handle the uh, possibility of having uh, like an X on that side of the, uh, of the decision boundary, right? And how are we going to do that? Well, um, let's have some additional variables, uh, SI, which are greater than or equal to zero, right? And say that instead of this being bigger than or equal to one, just has to be bigger than or equal to one minus SI, right? And so um, SI is going to be, uh, right, it'll be, um, uh, it'll essentially measure the distance to get you onto the right side of the margin, right? Um, although uh, it's going to be scaled by the norm of this constraint, right? And so, uh, obviously, um, if we just did this program, well, we'd set v equal to zero to minimize this and all of the slacks to whatever it took to satisfy these constraints. And so what we have to do is trade off making everything a slack, meaning a mistake, versus uh, making our vector short. And so uh, what we're going to do is just um, add a penalty plus uh, c times the sum over all i of the ith slack. Right? And so what's going to wind up happening now is that for very big slacks, we're going to uh, wind up wanting to reduce them. Right? If, if v is 0, well, there's no penalty for moving a little bit away from 0 because the quadratic is flat there. And so we'll move v a little bit away and decrease the corresponding slacks. At some point, there's no point in decreasing the slack anymore once it gets to 0. Right? So that's going to correspond to these guys. And, uh, you know, depending on what the value of C is, we'll trade off against having a wide margin, right, a short V versus um, uh, low slacks, few mistakes. Okay? What we really want is for the slack vector to be sparse, right? We want few mistakes, and this is the standard L1 trick of, repla of, of encouraging sparsity by having a, uh, uh, an L1 penalty on a vector. So um, I think uh, rather than try and derive the dual of the support vector machine in the next three minutes, uh, I think it's probably a good place to stop. So we'll see you guys uh, next time around. Thanks.